Hello friends, my name is JJ, and as I am sure you know, last week the world sat captivated as the United States Congress tried and failed 14 times to elect a Speaker of the House of Representatives before finally picking Republican Kevin McCarthy on the 15th ballot. McCarthy narrowly beat Democrat Hakeem Jeffries 216 to 212 on a mostly party line vote, with six Republican members abstaining by voting present. Now, one of the reasons this took so long is because the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, who in the American system is a sort of prime minister type figure who leads the legislative branch, has to be elected by an outright majority of House members. Each member is free to vote however they want, and if no candidate for Speaker can get a majority, they just keep voting until somebody does. McCarthy was broadly liked by most Republicans, but a small hard right faction within his party, about 20 people or so, stubbornly refused to vote for him until he made a bunch of political concessions to them and brought them over to his side. Now, the spectacle of all of this evoked a lot of strong reactions. Many people felt that the Republican congressmen who kept voting against McCarthy were behaving in a way that was very disrespectful and even undemocratic. Others, however, said that it was disrespectful and undemocratic for McCarthy to feel so entitled to the speakership, to argue he had earned it, as he was quoted as saying. Some said he should have just stepped down after losing the first few votes and let someone else be the Republican candidate for speaker instead. Others just threw up their hands and said there's got to be a better way to pick who gets this job. And the whole conversation struck me as quite interesting because these sorts of discussions represent an important debate about democracy that I feel we don't engage in often enough. Usually when we talk about democracy and voting and voting systems, we tend to focus on the sort of voting done by individual voters. You know, how votes are cast and counted when ordinary citizens head out to elect their mayor or governor or member of Congress or parliament or whatever. But we spend a lot less time talking about the elections that occur on the level above this. Elections in which our elected representatives representatives themselves vote for some higher ranking person, be he a speaker or a prime minister or even just a candidate for higher office. So today I thought we would write that wrong and spend some time talking about these types of elections because in many ways they are just as important as the other kind and thus worth having an opinion on. So when we as citizens vote on something directly, we are participating in what the political scientists usually call direct democracy. Voting in say a referendum is direct democracy, but in theory, voting for a politician can be a form of direct democracy as well, at least in the sense that the people are being directly trusted with the specific decision of who should hold this or that office. Once a candidate is elected, however, they become part of a government run by indirect democracy, wherein elected politicians make day-to-day -day decisions on behalf of the people. Now, the question of to what degree politicians should care about the opinions of voters after they've been elected is one of the oldest debates in indirect democracy. Edmund Burke, the 18th century British politician and philosopher, who is often considered the founder of Anglo-American conservatism, was on the more unapologetically elitist end of this debate. He wrote a famous letter in 1774 in which he said that he thinks a good politician owes you not his industry only, but his judgment. And he betrays you instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we could think of a more modern politician who is terrified of making a decision about anything without first consulting a public opinion poll. Someone like, say, Bill Clinton, who according to a famous and probably apocryphal story, once commissioned a poll to see where he should take his family on vacation. Now, I'm sure that most of us would agree that there is some virtue in both of these approaches. There are times in which we might trust a politician to use their own best judgment when addressing an issue, and there are times in which we might want our politicians to pay a lot of attention to where public opinion is. But what about when a politician is called upon to elect a different 
higher ranking politician. Which approach should be favored in that specific context? The United States is probably the best example of a country whose political system embraces the most aggressively anti-elitist answer to that question. Take the election of the US president. In the original vision of the founding fathers, every four years, Americans were supposed to vote for a few hundred special politicians known as electors, who would gather in an electoral college and decide who the president of the United States was going to be. The thinking is that the electors would be these very wise and sophisticated people who would pick a much better president than the voters could pick on their own. Over the years, however, this became seen as a rather elitist setup, and reforms were passed that steadily made the electors more and more powerless and symbolic, even though they still technically elected the president, and even still technically do today. This ballot from 1920 is a good illustration of how this system was starting to change in the early 20th century. You can see that you are still being asked to vote for electors for the Electoral College, but it doesn't really matter who you vote for since the candidates for elector are all sorted into columns based on which presidential candidate they will support. And then after a while, they just stopped printing the names of the candidates for elector on the ballots at all. The new understanding was that the winning political party would just scrape up some random gang of hacks to serve as electors after the fact because no one expected them to be anything but a rubber stamp anymore. Many states actually now have laws recently upheld by the Supreme Court that legally force electors to just be mindless figureheads who blindly vote for whatever presidential candidate won the popular vote in their state. So the modern system basically makes a mockery of the Founding Fathers' original intent, but since it reflects how modern Americans feel democracy should work, no one really makes a big fuss about it. A slightly more controversial example would be the election of American political candidates themselves. At one time, Democrat and Republican candidates for pretty much every office from president on down were chosen in a very opaque and elitist way that today is often pejoratively known as the smoke-filled room. Basically, some gang of party bigwigs who had been chosen by God knows who would get together and be like, yes, this fellow will make a fine candidate for senator, with the role of the public being to simply take him or leave him during the general election. The smoke-filled room system eventually gave way to a more formalized and bureaucratized process known as nominating conventions, wherein ordinary voters who supported one party or the other would elect delegates to a party convention, and those wise delegates would in turn elect the candidates. So again, basically, indirect democracy. Nowadays, however, this system has also fallen out of favor as being too elitist, and so now most states hold primary elections a few months before the general. In a primary election, basically any ordinary voter who considers themselves a supporter of the Democrats or Republicans gets to elect that party's candidates directly. Now, the nominating convention system remains the most popular system for choosing political candidates in other parts of the world, but the idea of directly electing candidates is slowly starting to catch on outside of America as well. It certainly seems to be becoming more common for candidates at like the head of state level. French presidential candidates are now elected directly by party members, for instance, as are candidates for Prime Minister here in Canada. The Prime Ministerial candidate of the British Labour Party is directly elected by party members, while the candidate of the British Conservatives is chosen in a more complicated, multi-step system, but party members still get final say. Ironically enough, the process of picking the US presidential candidates for the two big parties is a little complicated as well. Technically, they are still chosen through a convention system featuring a few thousand elected party delegates. But on the other hand, these delegates are supposed to be mostly symbolic people whose names don't even appear on the ballot. They are pledged to support one candidate over another and can't really use any individual discretion, much like the electors in the Electoral College. But this system can still cause some complications when an election is very close and the delegates are badly divided into multiple rival factions, as we will discuss in a bit. But before we get to any of that, let us just walk through the logic 
that rationalizes this sort of direct democracy. Basically, the argument goes like this. A politician is a powerful figure who has the capacity to make decisions affecting the lives of the public. Therefore, the public should exert maximum control over his selection. The public knows what is in their interests better than anyone else, and to the extent that anyone exists between the public and their capacity to choose who governs them, those middlemen should either be removed or made powerless and subordinate to the public. The main critique of this approach, in turn, is basically just the case for elitism in general. As old man Burke would say, sometimes elites do, in fact, know what is better for the public than they do themselves. So rather than constantly seeking to remove the middlemen that stand between us and our rulers, perhaps we would be better off toning down our egos and deferring to their wisdom and judgment. And indeed, Americans who are disappointed with the quality of politician that their system has been producing lately will sometimes express nostalgia for the smoke-filled rooms. A lot of Republican politicians are actually officially in favor of improving the quality of the Senate by ending direct election for senators and going back to having them indirectly elected by state legislatures as they used to be a hundred years ago. But all that said, even in America, using indirect democracy to pick important politicians is still widely embraced as the best way to pick the leaders of the legislative branch. This would be the system that we saw in action with Speaker McCarthy's recent election. The 435 members of the United States House of Representatives are elected as party candidates by the public and then elected to office by the public as well. But the Speaker of the House, the House's day-to-day -day leader, is elected by House members in a way that the public has no real control over. Kevin McCarthy is a Republican, but he was nominated to be the Republican Party's candidate for Speaker by the Republican members of the House not ordinary Republican-affiliated members of the public. He was in turn elected Speaker, eventually, by a majority of the assembled House. Again, not the public. Now, the Speaker is sometimes called the second most powerful politician in Washington, but the first most powerful politician is, of course, the President, who, as we discussed, is more or less directly elected by the public. So we could say that these two leaders with their two different methods of election kind of balance each other out. But of course, in many other countries, their whole government is basically only led by one person, and that person is chosen exclusively through indirect democracy, or as it is perhaps more commonly known, the parliamentary system. Germany is a good example. The German public elects the German parliament, and the Chancellor of Germany, who is the sole leader of the German government, is elected by that parliament, not the public. Similarly, German political parties nominate candidates for Chancellor through what is basically a smoke-filled room type system involving just a small handful of party elites. In Germany's last election, for instance, the Chancellor candidate of the Social Democratic Party, Olaf Scholz, was unanimously appointed by a board of just 35 people. And then, after a new German parliament was elected, that parliament voted 395 to 303, with six abstentions to make Olaf Scholz chancellor. That vote, in turn, only came following 10 weeks of very intense negotiations between all of the various members, factions, and parties of the German parliament. They had to come up with some sort of agreement to get Schultz elected with a majority vote, which is what their system requires. Schultz's party did not itself control a majority of seats in the parliament, so he had to make promises and assurances to win the votes of many members who had just finished campaigning against him. So in conclusion, the German system is one that asks ordinary German citizens to defer quite heavily to the good judgment of their politicians when it comes to deciding who should run their government. The line between the party you vote for and the person who winds up as chancellor is not something you can take for granted, since the person a party thinks should be running the country is a conclusion that will ultimately be negotiated behind closed doors. An even more extreme example would be Italy, 
where the person who gets chosen to be prime minister might not even be a politician at all. After an Italian parliamentary election, the Italian political parties all negotiate amongst themselves and try to settle on someone, anyone, who they can all agree should run the country. It might be a current party leader, or it might be a complete outsider who has never been elected to anything. Italy has had several prime ministers in recent years who had never held political office before, but were instead senior government bureaucrats of one form or another who were chosen precisely because their apolitical background made them the sort of person who could earn the support of a majority of members in a diverse parliament. Again, this is a system in which the public is kept relatively distant from the most important decision that is being made, but the logic would be that that is okay because it is not the public's place to make the most important decision. The public elects members of political parties that broadly reflect their values and aspirations, and the members of those parties are then trusted to work out a national leadership system amongst themselves that will provide the best administration to see those goals achieved. Defenders of this way of doing things will often make the case that indirect election is a process that makes voters think more about the priorities and outcomes of government and less about the personalities of the individual politicians who run the government who might be fairly overrated and interchangeable anyway. The middle ground would probably be a system like what we have here in Canada, where the prime minister is not directly elected, but political parties still make it abundantly clear to voters that when you vote for a member of parliament belonging to this or that party, you are helping elevate that party's candidate for prime minister to the top job. In Canada, we also have a strong tradition of letting the plurality rule, which is another principle that not all countries and systems think is that important. So for example, Prime Minister Trudeau's party did not win the majority of seats in the Canadian Parliament, and in fact only did once during his three terms, but he did win the most seats every time, and in Canada's political tradition, it would be considered fairly undemocratic for someone other than the guy who got the most seats to be Prime Minister. The logic would be that more Canadian voters wanted Trudeau than anyone else, and therefore, even if a majority of Canadians didn't vote for him, a much larger majority of Canadians didn't vote for the other guys, so they have even less of a right to be in charge. Canada doesn't even do a formal vote in which the Prime Minister is officially elected by Parliament. The head of the largest party is simply installed as Prime Minister after a parliamentary election, and some time later there is a mostly symbolic and often unanimous vote to affirm him. Canadian political culture places more importance on the idea of using the parliament to vote a weak prime minister out through the so-called vote of no confidence, rather than building parliamentary coalitions and so forth in order to put a prime minister in. The validity of letting the plurality rule came up during the last US presidential election as well, during the Democratic primary. At one point, it looked like Bernie Sanders might win the most delegates to the Democrats' presidential candidate nominating convention, even though all of the other candidates would win a combined total of more delegates overall. And it became something of a controversy over what the most democratic outcome of this situation should be. To let Sanders be the nominee on plurality rules logic like we use in Canada, or for the delegates of all of the other candidates candidates to huddle together and come up with some alternative candidate akin to what happens in Italy. The candidates were actually asked about their perspective on this question during one of the debates, and I think it's kind of interesting to see. Should the person with the most delegates at the end of this primary season be the nominee, even if they are short of a majority? Whatever the rules of the Democratic Party are, they should be followed. And if they have a process, which I believe okay. they do, I'm trying to do so this that yes, everybody else, fast. everybody can do. Can, so you can. want the convention to work its will? Yes. Senator Warren. But a convention working its will means that people have the delegates that are pledged to them, and they keep those delegates until the leading you come person? to the convention. No. All okay. The All righty. Vice President Biden. Play by the rule. Yes or no, leading person with the delegate, should they be the nominee or not? No, let the process work its way out. Mayor Buttigieg? Not necessarily, not to lose Senator the Senator Klobuchar? Let the process work. Senator Sanders? Well, the process includes 500 superdelegates on the second ballot. 
So I think that right. the will of the people should okay. prevail. Yes, right. Person thank you guys. Most votes should become the nominee. Without getting too much into the weeds about super delegates and all of that, it is revealing that the responses of the candidates to this question were so obviously self-serving. Bernie supported letting the plurality rule because he would benefit from it, while the others didn't because they could imagine a scenario in which they might be the compromise candidate chosen by a broad anti-Bernie coalition. But what if, in this scenario, the various delegates at the Democratic Party convention were not able to agree on a candidate at all? What if their differences of opinion were just too vast to be reconciled around any one compromise figure? Well, this is another one of the great unresolved challenges of indirect elections, and there are basically two distinct strategies for dealing with it. The first is what we saw with Speaker McCarthy. When the politicians can't seem to agree on someone, you just force them to keep voting until they do, even if it takes months, and all other business of the nation grinds to a halt. Belgium, you may recall, went through such an episode a couple of years ago where it took them nearly two years to appoint their current prime minister, Alexander de Croo, because the negotiations among all of the various parties in the Belgian parliament went on for a very long time as they sorted out what the priorities of this new administration should be and what other politicians should be hired to run it. And the absence of a permanent executive branch able to make decisions for nearly two years had all sorts of negative consequences for the Belgian economy and their coronavirus strategy, among other things. The alternative to this is the idea of emergency elections. The idea if at some point politicians within a legislature cannot come to an agreement over who they want as leader, then the legislature should be dissolved and the voters should elect a new one. The logic of doing this is based on an assumption that the public should always be the ultimate source of guidance to the government. So if the politicians reach a stalemate, it basically falls to the public to elect better politicians. The problem with this argument, however, is that it places a rather high burden on the public to resolve a crisis that they were probably not cognizant they were creating in the first place. I believe this is what the economists call a collective action problem. When an assembly of politicians cannot come to an agreement, it is usually a reflection of the fact that they, well, disagree about too much. But that in turn probably just reflects the fact that the public itself disagrees about a lot. So going to the voters and being like, hey, why don't you guys elect a legislature with more people who agree this time kind of becomes a naive and unrealistic request. In practice, the public might simply elect the very same sort of people that they did last time not feeling that they did anything particularly wrong. This is, of course, what we saw in Israel over the last few years. The Israeli political system makes it very easy to dissolve the parliament when it is unable to elect a prime minister. And beginning in 2019, this happened four times in a row. Voters elected a diverse parliament that couldn't get along, so it was dissolved and an emergency election was held and voters basically just elected all of the same people back and things got deadlocked again. I guess the idea would be that if you force people to do this enough times, they will eventually break down and just make quote unquote the right decision, which I guess would mean electing one party to a clear majority. And that is sort of what happened with Israel. On their fifth consecutive election, Benjamin Netanyahu's right-wing electoral coalition eked out a narrow majority possibly out of voter exhaustion, and the viewer can decide for themselves whether that outcome validates this particular system. Anyway, my point today was just to illustrate the idea that democracy is complicated and there are fundamental difficulties in making it work in practice that we've never been able to fully resolve. When you're designing a democratic system of government, at some point you simply have to make trade-offs based on how much you value one principle 
over another. And a lot of what we have been talking about today comes back to the old Burkean era debate over how much we should trust wise politicians to make decisions that are in our best interests versus how much our politicians should simply be timid puppets who do exactly what the public demands. I think the question of politicians electing other politicians is the most interesting test study of these principles and practice, just because I think it gets into deeper personal psychologies of what it means for someone to have power over you and how you view the validity of authority more broadly. I would be very curious to know what you guys think of all of these different political systems, which one you think is best and why, and what critiques you might offer for each. If you come from a country that I haven't mentioned, I would likewise be very curious to hear where your country falls on the spectrum of direct democracy versus indirect democracy when it comes to this question of electing leaders. International reporting often doesn't give us a lot of details on how, say, political candidates are chosen in other countries. So I would be excited to hear more about how that works around the world from people in the know. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Do not forget to subscribe if you have not already, and I will see you next week.